Good morning, friends. My name is Claire. I serve on staff here and also with our eighth grade girls on Wednesday evenings. I'm going to be reading today's text, and we're going to be in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. All right, today we're going to be finishing our series through the Ten Commandments. We've taken ten weeks now to look into the Scriptures to see what God had to say for us in the Ten Commandments. And we've looked at why they would ultimately matter to us, a New Testament, New Covenant people, why does stuff in the Old Testament matter to us as well. Um, well, I'm going to be honest with you, we're going to finish on a, a good note today, but not an easy one, okay? So here's kind of what the, how the Ten Commandments work. Um, the first four commandments all have us looking upward toward God. God says, hey, I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Don't make false gods or graven images because I'm a jealous God. Then it's uh, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. So the first four have us looking up, but then the next five have us looking out toward other people. You don't murder. You don't steal. You don't commit adultery. Don't bear false witness. So they have us looking out at the people around us. Now, this, this final commandment, it turns and has us looking inward. This commandment which says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house or his wife or male or female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor, um, that's not something that you can usually see outwardly. Uh, I've never come and had a conversation with someone who was like, you know, um, I think I might be committing adultery, but I'm really not sure. I'm not, you know, I think I might have killed somebody, but I'm not totally positive of whether I've, I've done that or not or stolen something. Most of these are very clear. They're outwardly observable. But covetousness, covetousness is something that happens within our hearts. And what I'm going to ask you to do today is to just open your heart up to the Lord and have you ask Him to examine you to see if there be any covetousness within you. There's a in First Samuel or Second Samuel chapter twelve, uh, kind of the backstory there is King David, and he is a powerful king. God has brought him in as the king of Israel, who's a man after God's own heart, um, giving him extraordinary success in battle. He was enormously wealthy. He had a bunch of of wives and a bunch of servants. I mean, he had life was really good for David. But then one season, when the kings normally went off to war, David stayed behind. And he finds himself on the roof of his palace. As he's walking there, he looks down and he sees a woman named Bathsheba. And she was bathing there. And he coveted her in his heart. So he sends and has Bathsheba brought to him. And he sinned against her on that day. And he sinned against her husband, Uriah, who was off fighting with the fighting men of Israel. He sinned against his own wife. And he sinned against God. The prophet Nathan in 1 Samuel chapter 12 it confronts David and he tells him a, a simple story. He says there was a city uh, and there were a couple of different guys in this city. One was really wealthy. He had lots of camels and sheep and that's how they measured wealth then. I don't know what the equivalent is today. We probably don't get excited about camels or whatever. But this man, he was very wealthy. He had it going on herds and flocks like life was good for him. But there was another guy there in that city who was very poor. Matter of fact, he only had one ewe lamb. Man, that man loved that little ewe lamb. He fed it out of his meager provisions. He let it drink from his cup. He even slept with that lamb in his arms. So one day, a, a traveler comes into this city, and he comes to the home of the rich man. And the rich man, knowing that he needs to provide hosp hospitably for his guests, Rather than taking one of the sheep of his vast flocks and herds, he takes that little man's ewe. He slaughters it and prepares it for his guest. And David's hearing the story, and he's rightfully uh, upset. That man should die. He should pay back four times uh, that little lamb. Like, he should pay. And the prophet Nathan looks at him and says, You're that man. You're the man whom God had given a kingdom to. God had given enormous wealth. And you had Solomon's wealth. I mean, you, you were so blessed. 
But you took the poor man's wife. He'd ultimately sent Uriah, her husband, off to battle to be killed to cover up his sin. And for many of us, covetousness, covetousness in our heart comes from a very similar place. For David, he had been given so much, and God said, I would have given you even more if you had asked, but you chose to take what was somebody else's. For many of us, with regard to covetousness, we find ourselves in a place like David. If we were just to go back and kind of examine our lives, we would find that God had been so good to us. Certainly in terms of our physical provisions, like we, we have houses and we have cars and we have friends and families and God has been so good to us. And God has given us Jesus. He's given us so much in Christ where we were once separated from God through the work of Jesus. God has brought us near. We've been reconciled to him. We have a relationship with the God of the universe. He's forgiven our sin and invited us to fullness of life in him. But sometimes like David, maybe in an idle moment, we see something that somebody else has and we think, I need that. I need what they have. And we begin to want it and long for it. Maybe we fix our affections on that thing. We begin to pursue that thing. And we take you know, a few extra hours at work or some jobs on the side that we can attain that thing. And before long, we find that our hearts are wrapped up in the things of this world rather than all of the things of our Creator. It's covetousness. And it's destructive. And so our great God... The God of the universe, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who spoke the world into existence. The God of us, Elohim, who loves us and hears us and sees us and knows us. He gave us this command in Exodus chapter 20. You shall not covet. Now, covetousness comes out in a lot of different ways. Uh, if you were living during the time of Moses, all of this would have totally resonated with you. Uh, he, he lays it out here. You should not covet your neighbor's house. Or his wife, you shall not cover your neighbor's uh, male servant or female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that is, it, that is your neighbor's. Now, when he says your house here, um, it actually encapsulates the whole household. So he's saying you shouldn't covet what that man has. Maybe you could say you shouldn't covet his standard of living, his house or his stuff, the way in which he gets to carry about his life in this world, his wife would have been included in that as a possession, certainly the male and female servants there. Now, I don't know what ox and donkey would be for you. This has got to be LaFleur County terms. Uh, he might say to us, you shouldn't covet your neighbor's big jacked up truck with mud tires and loud exhaust or something along those lines, ladies. I don't know what it would be that you would like, uh, but we can covet a lot of different things. He concludes, in case he's left everything, anything out that we might be tempted to covet, you shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. Uh, for us, if it's not our neighbor's house or our neighbor's spouse, we might be tempted to covet his talents or his tools, fellas, it's true, his tools, his treasure or his, his physique. Ladies, you might be tempted to covet her job or her beauty or personality intellect, skills in business, artistic or musical abilities as well, that there are lots and lots of things that we could covet. And when we do so, uh, what we ultimately say is, is, God, I don't know that you knew what you were doing here. God, uh, in your provision for me, I, I think you might have got it wrong. Now, obviously, this is foolish of us. The God of the universe, he's all knowing, he's all good, he's all powerful. And God has given us exactly what we need for our highest good in this life. And when we covet, it's like saying, God, I'm not sure you knew what you were doing. I think I need a little more of this talent, this ability. I need to be more beautiful. I need more of your physical provisions in my life. It's second-guessing God. Um, as a matter of fact, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, the Apostle Paul, speaking to the church at Colossae, he says this. He says, Put to death, what er, uh, put to de to death therefore, what is earthly in you. And he lists sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. And then he calls those things what they really are idolatry. 
when we covet, when we not, listen, there's a difference here, by the way, between desiring something and coveting, right? So desiring something is you see a nice car go by and you think, man, I'd like to have one of those. To covet that is to fix our desire on it. It's to have an earnestness in our heart that I need to have that. Maybe it's the belief that if I had that thing, then I would be fully and finally satisfied. If I could just get a wife, then my life would be complete, right? Or I could have, you know, half a dozen kids, then my life would be where it needs to be. To covet it something is to want it earnestly. It's to set our desires and our affection and attention on something other than God. It's idolatry. It's to take something that is created and it's to place it on, that, on the throne of our hearts, the place that belongs only to our Creator. It's to covet that thing. Colossians 3.5 says that that is idolatry. It's giving our time, attention, affection to something other than God. And ultimately, we know that all sin is destructive. So what's the big deal with covetousness? Well, on the very first place, it's idolatry, which breaks the first commandment, right? We're sinning against the holy God of the universe, who thankfully is a good God and loves us. Uh, But he's also called us and he's shown us uh, the ultimate path that leads us to life in Christ. And that's not to pursue something other than God. The second thing about covetousness, it's not just idolatry, but it also fails to reflect God's nature to the world. Our God is a giving God. He is a self-sacrificing God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that we wouldn't perish but would have everlasting life. That's who God is. He gave His one and only Son. He's a God who gives, a God who provides. When we walk in covetousness, rather than reflecting this giving nature of God, you know what we're reflecting to the world? That it's really about us, not about what we can give, but about what we can get. It's about what we can receive. I need the next thing. My neighbor has it, and I want it as well. Now, it's, it's easy to get caught up in this. I was, uh, when I first started the ministry, took my first full-time position. I was a youth pastor straight out of college, and I was poor. I didn't have much at all. Uh, and there was a couple in our church, and they, they invited me to come to their, their lake house. I was like, you know, listen, I was eating hot dogs. I would literally get half a package of hot dogs and a couple of pieces of bread, and I'd put them on the bread on my plate and pour a can of chili over it and think, this was a great dinner. You know, I was still living college poor at that point. And this couple was so kind to me. They invited me to their lake house. And I remember going there, and I got in their really, really nice vehicle. I'm talking like leather. They had drop-down screens with headphones for their kids to drive in. You know, it was It was nice. And then we get to their really big, beautiful lake house overlooked Lake Washita. It was awesome. Then they took me out to dinner at this super fancy steakhouse that I could never afford. We got up the next morning. We got on their 32-foot cobalt that had a captain's call button so that when you hit it, the boat goes like, like boats should. You know, you could hear the engine, the power. It was amazing. And while they were an extraordinary blessing to me and letting me, you know, tag along and enjoy what God had given to them, I found myself afterward, even though I was dirt poor and couldn't afford any of that stuff, thinking, I wonder how I could get a boat. You know, like I need a boat. I, man, I need those things too, right? I began to covet what they had, that God had really just blessed me and let me go and enjoy some of the things that he had given to them. I began to covet those things in my heart. And I, I found that I was thinking about those things and like, man, I need that. And how am I going to get it? And for weeks on end, I thought, I'm not sure I ever want to go again because then I want what other people have and this isn't healthy. Covetousness, it's destructive. Rather than looking around and being thankful, because, and listen, I was back then. Y'all, I got a, a refrigerator for 400 bucks that somebody hooked me up with, and before that, I didn't have one. And I was so thankful for that $400 refrigerator. I got, rather than being thankful, though, for the things that I had, I, I started focusing on all the things that I didn't. And rather than seeing God's goodness and His provision to me through uh, the Holy Spirit of God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, through all the physical things that He had given I found myself instead thinking on, on the things that I didn't have. It was a place of misery. When we covet, we commit idolatry. We fail to express God's nature and character to the world. And then we experience the destructiveness of sin. 
Covetousness is one of those root-level sins that other things spring up out of. Do you know why we steal from our neighbor? It's because we covet what they have. Do you know why we want to commit adultery with our neighbor's wife? It's because we want what he has out of this root, this sin, root sin of covetous, uh, covetousness. Other things spring up and they bring destruction. And rather than enjoying all that God's given to us, rather than gaining something through covetousness, we ultimately lose even the things that we already did have because we no longer enjoy what God has given to us. C.S. Lewis, uh, in his book, The Weight of Glory, he says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong. We're not wanting too much, but really our desires are too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't, cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea, we are far too easily pleased. Covetousness, at the very core, it's idolatry. It is settling for something that pales in comparison to God. In Christ, we have all the riches of his glory. We have eternal blessings, all the fullness, everything we need for life and godliness. Like God has given us everything. And when we choose to covet, when we practice this idolatry, we settle for making mud pies in the slum when somebody has offered us a holiday at sea. Now, the good news is that Christ loves us. And Christ doesn't want to leave us in our idolatry or our sin or our covetousness. There's a story uh, in Luke chapter 18. It's a story of the, the rich young ruler, you might have heard it called. And it's, it's a fairly well-off man who comes to Jesus with a really good question. And he asks him, good teacher, m- what must I do to inherit eternal life? Again, this is a solid pursuit. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus is saying something there, right? Oh, if I'm good, God's good, right? Am I God? Right. So he's asking this question. And then verse 20, he says, well, if you want to inherit eternal life, you know the commandments. And he's about to quote the Ten Commandments here, or at least some of them. He says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, don't bear false witness, honor your mother and father. And this young man, who must have been very devout, by the way, he's able to stand before Jesus and say, all these I have kept from my youth. Y'all, I go to church. I was raised in church. I've been to Sunday school. I used to fill out all the check boxes and little envelopes. And before Sunday school, I brought my Bible. I tithed of my money. Like, I have kept the commandments. And in answer to this young man who is pursuing eternal life, which is what God gives us in Christ Jesus, right? He looks at this young man who just said, I've kept all the commandments. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. But when this young man heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And what Jesus did there, by the way, he's not calling on every person everywhere to sell every possession and give it all to the poor and follow him, um, not at least in the sense of physically. What Jesus did was he just placed his finger on the area of idolatry in that man's life. He placed his finger on the thing that was more important to this man than any other thing, the thing that had become ultimate. It was his riches. It was what they could afford. He ultimately had come to believe that some sort of created thing was more precious and more valuable than communion with his creator. There was a temporal thing that he found to be of greater worth than that which was eternal. And I just wonder... If we could, we'll just pretend for a minute. I wonder what Jesus would say to us. If we could just say to him, um, if he asked us the question, you know, do you keep the commandments? And we could say, Lord, we've kept all these from our youth. I wonder what thing Jesus might put his finger on in our life or point to and say, hey, this is the thing in your life 
that is of more importance to you than I am. This is the thing that's displaced God on the throne of your heart. This is the thing that you've made an idol of. And for many of us, there's some created thing. And we said, if I could just have that, if I could just get the house or the spouse, and I want her beauty, I want his talent, I want his business acumen or whatever it might be, that Jesus would say, hey, would you just give that up and come and follow me? Now, I want to be clear. There's nothing wrong with having a lake house or a boat or a nice vehicle. There's nothing wrong with having a lot of riches. There's something wrong with having an idol in our life because it is ultimately destructive to us. It is sinning against a holy God. It doesn't lead to our fullness or abundance. It leads to our destruction. If Jesus was having this conversation with you, is there something in your life that he would put his finger on and say, hey, I want you to give that up. There's something that's on my throne in your heart. There's something that you're clinging to that you've held to be of more value value than the kingdom of God. And the right response for all of us is to recognize the utter worth of Christ Christ. To recognize his value, his glory, his weight above every other thing, and to joyfully give up whatever thing that we might have in the place of God in our lives. Covetousness takes earthly created things and it puts them in the place of our Creator. These earthly things that can never satisfy us, it replaces or it puts them in the place of God who can ultimately, fully, and finally satisfy us. It reminds me of Jesus in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, when he says, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, but forfeit his soul? Now, for those of us who are believers in Jesus, we believe that he is all that we need. We believe that God is our provider. He is our heavenly Father who knows what we need before we even ask. We believe he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords who knows all and sees all and hears us when we come before him. For us to covet is in a sense to say, God, you're not enough. God, there's something that you forgot about. There's something that I need in, 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 beyond what you're ultimately providing for me. There's something more that I need besides you. Is there something in your life that you believe that you need beyond what God has provided I think it's really tragic that rich young man, and he had some wealth, that he wouldn't give up in exchange for eternal life. And you, you think about the way that that man lived. Like, you think first century with, with Jesus, that rich man, he didn't have air conditioning, he didn't have refrigeration, he didn't have a car to drive in. He didn't go, get to go and fly around and, you know, visit tropical places and go on vacations. We might look at that man and think, oh, how foolish is that? He traded eternal life for these little temporary earthly perks that weren't even that good. And if people could write stories, maybe a few thousand years from now, about modern Americans, they might make fun of us for the same. They traded eternal riches and glory or temporary earthly things. Covetousness, it's idolatry before God. It's ultimately destructive to our hearts, and it fails to reflect the goodness of God, His giving nature to a world who needs to see it. So I have a question for you. Um, What are you turning to? What are you longing for? What are you seeking after to fulfill the deepest longings of your soul? Is it a house, or a spouse, or a car, Is it the applause or approval of men? What thing are you coveting after, believing that if you got that thing, you would finally feel full? Is it a job title or pleasure or comfort or affluence? Is it beauty? All of those things pale in comparison to the riches that we have in Christ. Fullness of joy living water, the bread of life, that we might never hunger or thirst again, that we might be filled to overflowing. The Apostle Paul 
list some accolades. I mean, he was kind of a big timer in the first century. A Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was trained under Gamaliel, highly educated. He was a pretty influential person in the synagogue. And he said, whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. There are things in this world that get propped up before us as things that we think enhance our value or worth, right? But in the kingdom of God, we consider those things but loss, that we might know Christ and be found in Him, that we might have the richness of a relationship with God where we get to walk with Him and enjoy the riches of His kingdom. We live in a world that thrives on covetousness. Every ad you watch, um, whether on television, on YouTube, everyone's trying to sell you something that you need. We have a holiday season that's coming, and they're not just going to make you think you need things, but if there's certain things out there that if you don't buy them for your kids, your kids are never going to be happy, right? That's the way that we're presented over and over and over in our world. We live in a world of covetousness. So what do we do? How are we as the people of God to take the King of kings and the Lord of lords seriously at his word and to not live lives of covetousness where we're always wanting the next thing, whatever it is that our neighbor has, the newest gadget, whatever it might be. How are we to walk in faithfulness before the Lord as fully devoted disciples of Jesus? In 1 Timothy 6, 6, the Apostle Paul gives us a, a simple sentence that I want you to remember. He's writing to the young man, Timothy, who he, you know, sent on various journeys, left behind in various places. He would write him letters. And he gave him this simple little statement in 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And when you think about that, it kind of seems backwards, doesn't it? Because what we often believe is if I could get the next thing, the house, the car, the wife, the whatever it might be, that would be gain to me, right? I'm gaining something when I get stuff. But what Paul is saying to his young man, Timothy, is that to follow Jesus, to live a life before him that honors him, to walk in righteousness, godliness, with not with covetousness, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You want to know a rich and full and satisfying life, the richest, fullest, most satisfying life you're ever going to live? It's not by getting the next thing and gaining more for you and yours. But living a godly life and walking in contentment, trusting that God who knows you and loves you more than you even love yourself has given you exactly what you need in Him even among your physical possessions, to live the richest and fullest, most satisfying life you could ever possibly live. For Him to give you more would only hurt you. And so we trust the Lord, reminding ourselves day after day, God, You are enough. Thank You for my physical provisions for my house that doesn't leak most of the time. Thank you, God, for my car that runs most of the time. God, thank you for the job you provided, the family you've given me. You've given me a wife or for you a husband. God, you have given richly to me. Thank you, God. May I live a life of godliness with contentment, trusting that that is great gain. It's a practice for us day in and day out. You know, here's the thing. With that couple that took me on, on vacation, that little trip to the lake, it was a real blessing, and I'm, I'm thankful for what they did. I, I didn't even know I wanted those things until I saw them. I had to be reminded before kind of covetousness brought something out in me. In the same way, we have to remind ourselves to walk in contentment. We should consistently kind of take the pulse of our heart to see where we are. Man, am I chasing after the things of this world? My longing for more, believing that if I got those things, then I could be happy. Or am I believing God that He is enough? Am I finding my satisfaction and contentment in Him? Trusting that godliness with contentment is great gain? Or am I really putting something else in that blank? Godliness plus this would be gain. 
for us as the people of God is just to be reminded of His sovereignty in our lives. Over everything that we experience, God is sovereign. Over the good times and the bad, over the times of plenty, and over those times that are kind of lean, through easy circumstances of lots of comfort, through very difficult circumstances where there's not much. Do you believe that God is enough? Do you believe that godliness with contentment is what brings great gain for us? Today, maybe for you, it's a day of repentance. And maybe as you've been here for this whole series through the Ten Commandments, you've begun to feel conviction. Well, I've told you throughout this series four things about the Ten Commandments that I wanted you to know. I wanted you to know that they are not the path to salvation. Keep them in your in, break them in your out. That's not how it works. Uh, I wanted you to know that the Ten Commandments are the words of God, that God spoke to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. I wanted you to know that they teach us who God is. They reveal His nature and His character to us. And I wanted you to know that the Ten Commandments, they keep us free. They keep us from going off in the ditches of destruction in our lives as believers. But there's one more thing I want you to know about the commandments. As we think about the ten things we've heard over the last ten weeks, I want you to know that God has given us the commandments to lead us to the cross. It is my heartfelt prayer and hope for you that over the last ten weeks, that somewhere in the midst of this, that God has opened your eyes to your utter sinfulness before him. And maybe you're not a murderer, but your heart's been filled with anger. Or maybe you haven't committed adultery outwardly, but it's in your heart. Or maybe you're filled with covetousness. You bear false witness against your neighbor. These commandments are gifts to us from God, and they were ultimately meant to lead us to the cross of Jesus Christ. Here's what this means. Once you come to the recognition that you are a sinner, then you're ready to hear about Him who is a Savior. Once we realize that we're sinful before God, that we can't do enough good things to somehow outweigh the bad things of our lives, that if we've sinned, we've fallen short of God's perfect righteous standard, the only hope for us is one who would be a Savior. And God looked down on the world. He looked down on you and me. He knew your name. And in love, while we were still yet sinners, demonstrate that, demonstrated that love for us by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. To die for you. That you might not live a life that is burdened and characterized by sin and pain and death and destruction but that you might live the abundant life in Christ Jesus. Jesus knows your sin. He knows your name. He cares for you. And Jesus went to the cross. He came to this earth. He lived a perfect, sinless life. And he offered himself on the cross as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. That means his blood was shed so that ours didn't have to be. Jesus died that we might be reconciled to God and have a relationship with Him, know the abundance and fullness of God, to have riches in Christ Jesus. We receive salvation on the basis of one thing, and that is faith in Jesus Christ, which means you can't earn it, you can't work for it and somehow attain enough favor with God that He's going to save you. We, we are saved by grace through faith alone. Today I want to remind you, if you're a believer here, the work that Jesus Christ did for you, can you just be reminded of his work on the cross for you? Of what Jesus Christ endured, the suffering, the agony of the cross, and Jesus did that in love for you, that you might find life and life to the fullest in him. And we're moved to worship and be grateful for all that he's given. If you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus, the last 10 weeks might have been tough on you because week after week you've just come to know more and more how much of a sinner you are. and That's not a terribly exciting church service, right? But the good news is the commandments lead us to the cross. The good news is that Jesus Christ died for you that you might find new life in Him, that your sins might be forgiven. The Scriptures tell us that He takes our sin as far from us as the East is from the West. Jesus bore your sin and your shame the full penalty for your sin was paid on the cross. Jesus cried out there, it is finished. The debt has been paid. 
we receive the gift of salvation and forgiveness of this relationship with God, we receive it through faith. And if you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, you've never just bowed before him and said, Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I trust in you and your work, your death and burial and resurrection to save me from my sin. Today, I want to plead with you. Entrust yourself to God. Cry out to Him. He is a faithful God who wishes to save you. Would you bow with me? Father, we, we bow before you now and we thank you for your goodness. We're reminded that you alone are worthy of all glory and honor and praise. You alone satisfy us and fill us. God, you are more than enough. I pray that we as a church might not spend our lives chasing after the empty things of this world, but God, our hearts may be set upon you. Lord, we're a church of adulterers and murderers and liars and thieves, people who have failed to honor our mother and father, certainly idolaters. But we're here today because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because you have saved us from our sin. God, we're a people who are striving to live as disciples, following after you. Living as citizens of your kingdom. So I pray, God, for those who need to repent here today. Would you lead us to repentance, to turn away from our sin and turn back towards you? For those in the room that don't know you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Would you draw their hearts to you in faith? Father, we trust in your sovereign work. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.